We are good together. We are good together. We are a team. <laughs> Because it's 
been like a nice, long, slow build-up, and it seems like perfect timing. It was worth waiting for, because today is really wonderful. I feel it was fantastic. And I love you. A loving and uh, caring God, parent of us all, you know our grief, our experience of loss, for you suffered the death of your beloved son. We pray that you can give us strength to go forward from this day, trusting where we cannot understand that your love never ends. We are truly thankful this day for the past gift of Roger's presence in our lives. Beloved husband to Mammon, father to Shelley, Sandy, Rico, and Gina, grandfather to Brad and Shelley's children, and, and my brother, as well as a friend to a cast of many, we honor and celebrate his life this day. Roger left a mark upon all of us as well as others who could not be here, especially through his gift of music. And we commend him this day for your care and keeping and pray for all of us and others who could not be here this day as we face this loss and as we celebrate his life. All this and so much more we pray in the name of your son Jesus. Amen. You know, over the past several years, I would uh, look for particular birthday cards to send to my brother, since we've been so far apart for so all these years. Uh, cards particularly that uh, were graced with a lot of humor, uh, because I, I knew he got a, a kick out of humor and the lighter side of life. And uh, a few 
months ago, I came across a card in this uh, card shop, and I said, this is the one for this coming uh, January. And unfortunately, I cannot send it. And sometimes I would pick out cards that were a little bit irreverent, <laughs> uh, such as this card. So uh, pardon the expression as I share it with you this day. But, uh, I thought this was great. It was a, a picture of this little, you can't see, a lot of you can't see it, but there's a little boy sitting on the commode of the toilet. But when, as you open it up, it says, uh, See, I do give a shit about your birthday. <laughs> to drive, but we drove for five days across country. Obviously, we live in Florida now, so I took, uh, you know, uh, Route 10. And when we got to Texas, from Houston to El Paso, El Paso, 845 miles. We spent three days in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, despite the distance that we have lived apart from one another uh, all these years of, of being adults, I believe we were always close in heart and mind. Close in heart and mind. Uh, the paths that our lives uh, took uh, in terms of careers were vastly different in a lot of ways. Uh, he, the jazz composer and musician, me, the crafter of sermons and, and preaching them. Uh, I remember uh, Madeline and Roger coming to visit one time, and I think they attended a worship service where I preached. And, Soon after that uh, service, Roger said, now that I heard you preach, uh, it might have been the first time you ever heard me preach, he said, now I want you to come down to Southern California to hear me preach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have to say that I was extremely proud of my brother and what he had accomplished in life. I know what he had been doing all these years was the fulfillment of his childhood dream. I can recall that picture, and it was in the video presentation today with him as a little boy holding that little silver soprano tag, uh, sax. And um, and uh, from that point on through the years, he truly provided a gift of music uh, through his composing and his uh, his leadership, his playing, and also his teaching. Another thing that I think was uh, really significant in terms of uh, Roger was his storytelling. And he came by that honestly because my dad loved to tell stories. And usually the stories my dad would tell would be funny, full of humor, and the same with Roger. And sometimes he'd start telling a story and you saw him laughing in, in the video presentation. And he'd start laughing and he couldn't continue to give the account of the story because of all that laughing. Uh, I, I did recall one thing in particular, and he'd love to tell this story occasionally, where this was, uh, as, as many people say in, in, you know, in your other life, or this happened years ago. Um, my uh, first wife and I uh, went down one winter to visit with uh, Roger and his first wife, and at that time he was uh, teaching in a little town of Iowa called Guthrie Center near Des Moines, Iowa. And, their apartment where they lived was rather small, so much so that we had to borrow a mattress from the landlord who lived in the apartment below. And in order to get to the upper apartment, you had to go outside some staircase that was just filled with ice since it was in the winter. And a lot of snow on the ground is typical for Iowa. And uh, when we went downstairs to the landlord's apartment, he came walking out with this double-sized mattress simply under his arm like this. 
He handed it to Roger and me, and we lost control of the mattress. <laughs> it folded out, and we both fell flat on our face on the mattress. And we started laughing, and we couldn't stop. And we, I don't think we ever convinced the landlord that we weren't drunk. <laughs> and then he should have seen us as we tried to go up that icy uh, staircase carrying this double mattress. It was like a scene out of a Laurel Hardy movie. <laughs> what had happened you know, in the process of that experience. And there were other such occasions of grace, grace with humor and laughter, and thanks to a large part to Roger. Uh, I have to say that he was really fun to be with. Fun to be with. In many respects, he really was the life of the party. Do you agree? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, he had a great spirit. And I'm sure I speak for others of you who are here. That is really true. And I would at least like to finally say that our relationship with brothers was one of love and respect and appreciation for one another and what we both had accomplished in terms of our lives. And to be sure, when we were growing up, we had the usual kind of fights that brothers would have or siblings would have. I mean, I remember one occasion when I was winning for the first time in a game of Monopoly, and he became so frustrated with the fact that he was losing for the first time, he tried to shove the Monopoly board down my throat. <laughs> I was wearing braces at that time. I, I turned into a bloody mess, as you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, then there was a time that uh, I was angry with him, and so I, uh, I think I chomped a piece of flesh out of his leg. <laughs> but uh, times when we were really tough. We were there for one another. And in many respects, he was always my protector, as his little brother. I do remember one occasion when I was in my late 30s and I was facing a personal crisis in my life and I came down and I visited with Roger and the Madeline. And there was one evening that Roger and I stayed up all night and we had talked and shared about our life and the past that we had experience in terms of being adults for the first time and in the deepest sense. And it was one of the most exhausting and yet ex exhilarating experiences in all of my life. And I'll never forget it. In fact, it was a life-saving experience for me. Let me simply say, and I couldn't have had a better big brother. And I miss him. I terribly miss him. And I'm sure this holds true for all of you as well. And I can only imagine now that he might be composing music or doing some uh, charts or, or some heavenly band. <laughs> Perhaps he's even playing as well. And so be it. So be it. I'd like to close with the following words from a book of meditations uh, I have had uh, for some time. Uh, the author named uh, Lois Cheney wrote this book entitled God is No Fool. And, and in that book, she said, bits and pieces, bits and pieces. People, people important to you, people unimportant to you, cross your life and touch it with love and carelessness, and they move on. It is with love and carelessness they move on, and, and then there are people you know that leave you and you breathe a sigh of relief and you wonder why you ever came into contact with them. And you, uh, and then there are people who leave you and uh, you breathe a sigh of remorse. And you wonder why they had to leave, go away and leave such a gaping hole. Children leave parents, friends leave friends, acquaintances move on, people change homes. Uh, people grow apart, enemies hate and move on, and friends love and move on. And you, you think on all the many who have moved into your hazy memory, and you look at those present and you wonder. And then she goes on to say, I believe in God's master plan in lives. God moves people in and out of each other's lives, and each leaves his or her mark on the other. And you find that you're made up of the bits and pieces of all who have ever touched their life, and you are more because of it, and you would be less if they had never touched your life. Pray God that you accept the bits and pieces in humility and wonder, and never question, and never regret. Bits and pieces, bits and pieces. 
or to be sure, in a sense, there is a sense of remorse, having to say farewell to Roger. In terms of his earthly existence, but there's also some sense of relief knowing that any kind of difficulty or pain or suffering that he's had is, is, is over, is finished. Also, there's a strong sense of remembrance of the good and wonderful times and the myriad of experiences that all of us have had that remain sealed in our hearts and minds. So even in the midst of sorrow, we can say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. For Roger, Roger not only studied, but taught at Berkeley School of Music in Boston and for almost two years. Roger's first daughter, Shelley, was born in Boston. He then moved to Los Angeles in 1968, and later his second daughter, Sandra, was born. In 1978, while on tour with the Billy Bond Orchestra, he met and very quickly fell in love with a beautiful singer. They were married in 1986. I remember asking Roger, which he kind of alluded to on the, uh, the video, why it took so long to ask Madeline to marry him. 
And he said with a smile, she wouldn't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> he actually did tell me that. <laughs> they have two beautiful children, Rico and Gina. And then in addition to his lucrative career as a saxophonist, woodwind player, composer, arranger, Roger has been a very active music educator for over 30 years in the venues all across this country. For over 30 years, he would return to teach at the summer jazz camp in Iowa. And also at the Jazz Goes to School in Bell, Colorado. In 2002, he received the very prestigious Composer Arranger Award from the Los Angeles Jazz Society. In 2005, he received the Distinguished Alumni Award from Morningside and in 2012, the LA Jazz Society again honored him with their Jazz Educator Award. During Roger's career as a player, he performed with Woody Herman, Lee Castle, Jimmy Dorsey's band, Ray Anthony, Les Brown, Benny Carter, Tex Benneke, Bob Crosby, Peanuts Hucko, Ralph Carmichael, Greg Bill Holman, he's right over there. And, uh, and was featured solos, oh, with the Beach Boys, uh, and he was featured solos with uh, Nino a Day. And Roger worked on numerous sound recordings, and I have to add an addendum here is I still call him records, but as my position as vice president of the union, I am supposed to say sound recordings, <laughs> <laughs> TV shows, and motion pictures. As an arranger and composer, he has, he has wrote, written for Count Basie, Ray Anthony, Bill Toll, The Beach Boys, Jerry Garcia. <laughs> And Jillian, Davis Gaines, the Raylex, and the Phil Norman Ten Tech. He, he composed for the Buddy Rich Band, great chart, hopefully everybody's ears played it, and the Juicer is Wild. And he also arranged Ray Charles' big hit on Oh, What a Beautiful Morning. In the late 70s, he formed, well, in the middle 70s, he formed his very own big band in Los Angeles. The name of the band was Roger Newman's Rather Large Band. The reason for the title was not because they were large guys built up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> see, where were they? but because uh, uh, in a normal sized big band, uh, there's four trumpets, three trombones, four saxes, and three rhythms. Roger's band, he wrote for five trumpets, four trombones, six saxes, including himself, and a rhythm section. The band produced two CDs. Introducing Roger Newman's rather large band and Instant Heat. The band also backed up his wife Madeline on her debut CD entitled This Is My Lucky Day. Roger's band performed in numerous events and concerts. Also, he, he, his band performed at the Governor's Ball following the Academy Awards. Roger always found that the education of young musicians was truly the most rewarding parts of his long and very distinct. He many times would comment how much fun it was working and teaching young musicians and guiding them to improve musically as well as teaching them the building blocks to having a career in music. Lastly, besides his love of music, he truly loved his family and was a wonderful husband, father, and bedfather. Roger survived by his wife Madeline, his children Rico, Gina, Shelley, Sandra, and his grandchildren, Jessica, Cody, and Brayden. May God bless you, our dear friend. Uh, now, script. I don't know. For the reflections, we would like to invite a few select members of Roger's family and friends to say a few. May, I was a singer with Belly Vaughn, and there was a tenor sax player named Roger Newman. Even though two years prior to that tour, we worked a casual together, and uh, we never saw each other again for two years until this tour. Uh, it was a four-week tour of Japan, 
and by the third week our relationship had grown into a beautiful friendship. <coughs> that song is one of Roger's favorites, and when you hear it later when the band is playing and you hear the lyric, you'll totally understand what I mean. I think the success of our relationship and marriage was that we were great friends, supported each other, and like Roger said, we were a team. We were. We never tried to change one another, and believe me, there were a lot of things we didn't agree on. <laughs> seriously, seriously. But somehow we made it work, and he'll always be in my heart. I want to thank all of the wonderful posts that were on social media, your phone calls, your texts, your flowers, your food, and this is really what's gotten me through these last couple weeks. To Roger's daughters, Sandra and Shelley, who have been in my life since they were 8 years old and 12 years old. And Shelley's kids, Jessica, Cody, Braden, Brad, and Brian. I love you like my own. Hal and Jeannie and Jamie Espinosa, thank you for coming out early. And they came all the way out from Maryland to help me prepare for this day. And I so appreciate you being here. And I especially want to thank Kirk and Joanne Smith for always being there for me, no matter what I asked of them. They were always there. And they've been true friends. And they were with Roger at the end. And that meant a lot to me. Most of all, Thanks to all of you here for sharing this day with us, and I'm forever grateful that you're all in my life. And now, here are my beautiful, beautiful children, our beautiful children, Rico and Gina. Uh, like my mom said, thank you all for coming out today, and thank you so much for the post, the messages you shared, offering support, all the uh, great stories that you've been sharing about my dad have been amazing, and it's been really nice. It's, it, it's been overwhelming in a positive way. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to share a quick story about my dad that showed the type of father he was to me. Uh, this happened years after high school. Uh, one of my favorite bands was playing two of their albums, Front to Back Live. And my dad just so happened to be working a gig down the street that same night. He's, when he found out about that, he mentioned to me, he said, oh, maybe I'll find a deal to check him out. That'd be cool. And I said, oh, yeah, for sure. Just thought he was being nice, didn't think much of it. Cut to that night, uh, my friends and I show up to the venue. And sure enough, my dad's waiting there at the box office. <laughs> and I was genuinely surprised. I walked up and I was like, dad, you actually came. He's like, yeah, yeah, my gig ended early, so I figured, why not? I was like, well, at least let me buy you your ticket. And of course, he insisted on paying. So we walk into the venue, and uh, I remind him one more time. I said, Dad, again, they're playing two full albums. It's going to be a long set. I totally understand if you're tired and you don't want to stay. If you take off, I won't be offended. And he just said, if I get tired after five or six, I'll take off. We can talk about the show later when you get home. I'm like, cool. Sounds good. Fast <laughs> forward, and the show ends. Venue's clearing out. And while I'm walking out, I notice my dad's right where I left him, in the back of the venue. He stayed for the whole show. <laughs> Again, surprised, he's like, Dad, you actually made it. You stayed for the whole thing. And he said, yeah, yeah, super positive. I think he was even trying to compliment the band. I think he said something along the lines of, yeah, they played really fast live, huh? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, they do. <laughs> and we uh, walked out of the venue, talked about his gig a little bit, and that was the end of that night. The point of that story is, my dad showed up that night to support me. Even if it wasn't something that he was necessarily interested in, the fact is he knew it was important to me, and he wanted to share that moment with his son. My dad was so kind, so patient, so supportive with me, and shared so much wisdom throughout his life, and I'm forever grateful for that. I'd be happy if I ended up being half the man he was. I'm, I know I've said this countless times since he's passed, 
that I honestly couldn't have asked for a better dad. I love you, Dad, and I miss you every day. Thank you all again for coming out today. It means more than you know to me and my family. <coughs> I'm going to read mine. <laughs> <laughs> there is no one like my dad. He was, like Rico said, my biggest supporter and favorite, favorite person. One of the many traits I love about dad is his attention to detail. If you've ever had a conversation with him, you knew he was listening to you. <laughs> He really gave you his full attention and had a genuine interest in you and your story. I already miss our long talks and our good hangs, as he always would say. I'm not sure what I'll do without you, Dad, but I'll continue to learn from you. I'll take my time. I'll do what makes me happy. Be present and love deeply. Rico and I are so lucky to have had you as our father. You and mom share the love with us that's one of a kind. It'll never be the same without you. I want to thank all of you for loving him so much. He was the best. father's second oldest daughter, and um, since Amanda told me my father's passing, I've been thinking a lot about main memories, and especially childhood memories. Like the road trips that Dad would take Shelly and I on when we were little, little kids, and one summer Dad took us cross country to Iowa and then to Ohio to meet up with Madeline. And Dad drove this old, beat-up, white, huge Chrysler tank, which we're trying to remember exactly what it was, but we couldn't. And the air didn't work, and, the, and well, it, it worked, but if we drove it in the high heat, the engine would overheat. So we'd have to turn the air off in the summer, and the windows would roll down, remember, Shelly and our hair would be flying everywhere. And it was squelching heat, and Shelly had to care because we were with our dad. I remember the many times when Dad would trade off letting Shelly and me steer his car when we were tiny tight. <laughs> and then he'd take us to an empty parking lot and actually let us drive and we could barely see over steering wheel. <laughs> and, you know, I think he enjoyed it as much as we did. We felt grown up, but he had this just look of joy in his face to see us driving as little kids and, and to see us happy. I also remember when my dad taught me to ride a bicycle and his encouragement. That final time I remember like yesterday when he held on and then let me go to ride a free. And I remember standing on his feet, his shoes, and him dancing when I was little. And And every time I hear that song, Butterfly Kisses, I think of Dad. Because I remember when I was little and he taught me what a butterfly kiss was, and we would give each other little butterfly kisses on the cheek and we would both giggle. But Dad had a great sense of humor, as everybody knows, and I can just envision him laughing and laughing and laughing until he would just cry and his people share so didn't say anything else. And some of my very favorite memories are with me and Shelly at the Musicians Credit Union. Um, we were little. <laughs> they came with us and we would listen to his phenomenal band practice and I would watch that sheer joy on his face 
Dad achieved something in his life that not everybody does. He made a living doing what he loved most. Everybody knows Dad was an absolutely amazing musician. But it was not always easy. There were many lean years, sleepless nights, copying music to make ends meet. And he never gave up. That's something I will always This year, my husband asked my dad, are you still playing the saxophone? And I looked back, knowing what the response would be. Dad had a grin on his face and said, am I still breathing? <laughs> I'm still alive, I'm playing the saxophone. Rico and Gina, my heart aches losing your father at such young age. And as you know, I lived with both of you when you were born, and I saw the precious love that dad had for you, and the joy that you brought him. And I heard the pride of his voice as he watched you both grow into amazing adults. Madeline, I'm sure you know this. My dad was so proud of the strong woman you were. I remember him telling me, I talked about a very challenging time you were going through. And in his words, sharing how proud he was of the amazing grace you had as you walked through that. And I just want to thank you so much for being such a wonderful wife to me two years. And for taking such good care of him during these final months that were so challenging and painful. I know he adored you. And I know he loved you so much, and I know how much you loved him. I live in Arizona. opportunity to be with my dad when he died. So very much. So many of you traveled far and far away. And you know, my dad touched lives everywhere he went. And he went a lot of places, as we know, a lot of places. And I always told him, I'm like, Dad, how, how do you do it? I don't know how you do it. But he did. He did. He traveled around the world doing what he loved. And I admired him so much for that. And I just, I, I want to take time right now. I want to thank Jean and Phil for doing the amazing video of Dad's Incredible Light. It's beautiful. Um, and of course, thanks to Madeline for the time these last few months of taking care of him and going above and beyond that you did because you loved him, of course. I admire and I want to thank my family too because they've been so supportive and they've helped me through this tremendously. I admired my dad for so many things. I'm so incredibly proud of him. I always loved having to meet my friends, always loved having him around, no matter what the occasion was. His talent as a musician always amazed me, and every single time I heard him play that saxophone, I just felt like I wanted to jump up and say, that's my dad, that's my dad. <laughs> there was never, ever a moment that I didn't feel that way when listening to him. Growing up, going to rehearsals, those were some of the best memories. I was so proud, meeting all the musicians, listening to them rehearse, watching dad be the great leader that he was, and the fun they all had together. 
It was the best. My dad had a passion for music that started at a very young age, having the ability to play various instruments, although, of course, the saxophone was absolutely his specialty, as we all know. And his ability to write music, again, it amazed me every single time. One of our recent visits to the hospital, Brad had asked him about his playing and his writing of music, and Dad just said he has music going on in his head all of the time. As a young girl, after a mom and dad split, Mom, Sandy, and I moved up to the Central Coast, and Dad would drive up there on a Friday, pick us up, bring us back down to Southern California, and then Sunday, take us back up so we could have time with him, and he did this countless, countless times. And that was just the kind of dad that he was. And some of my very best memories were our road trips to and sometimes back from the Midwest, like Sandy said, from Iowa. So many great sightseeing moments, so many laughs, so many great times. And one story that Dad would always share was the summer when I was learning how to drive. We were going to be traveling through the night, and I was very excited to practice my driving skills. Instead, I, along with Madeline and Sandy, practiced our sleeping skills. <laughs> so I never did drive that night, and Dad never let me hear the end of that, still joking and sharing that story to this day. <laughs> We all know that Dad had an infectious laugh. He would make me laugh just by his laughter, as I know you all have experienced. He would tell a funny story, but you start to say the story or tell a joke, and he would just crack up. And then his laugh was so infectious, you would just start laughing, not even knowing what the joke was or the story. I'll never forget, right after my grandpa's service, we were traveling in the car, and I believe we were going back to the airport. And Dad started laughing about something which made me start laughing, and then as I laughed, it made him laugh harder, and then it made me laugh harder. This went on forever, and it was hysterical, and to this day, I have no idea what we were laughing about. <laughs> Truly, I don't know. <laughs> but Dad had that knack, such a great laugh, and such a great sense of humor. Dad also had such a sweet, emotional side, and I love that about him. One thing that obviously touched him often was his music, and he would start to cry at music that touched his heart, or sometimes just sharing about something he heard, or something that someone played, he would begin to get choked up and get emotional. And Dad could talk, which I probably inherited a little bit of that from him. He was always so friendly to every single person he met, and he could carry on a conversation with anyone and always made people feel welcome. I love that about him, and as many of you have said, he was a bright light, loved by so many, and that was definitely my dad. When it came time for me to have my own children, my own kids, I was pregnant with my first baby, Jessica. And I'll never forget Dad telling me, Shelly, it is a love like no other, the love you will have for your children. And boy, he was so, so right. The laughter, the giggles, the talks, his easygoing nature. Dad certainly beat to his own drum, but it was an amazing drum, and it's one that we will all miss. I like to think I'm a lot like Dad in many ways, but one thing we didn't quite have in common was exercise. <laughs> Even though many times these last few months he'd say, I'm strong like bull, which yes, he was. He was fighting to the end, so he was strong in that regard, that's for sure. But one of the most recent days we were with him, he was telling us about his physical therapy, how he had walked and had done some bicep curls, and he was so cute and so proud he had curled two pound dumbbells. <laughs> So I patted him on the chest, and I said, Dad, I think you need to do some push-ups. And you'd think I asked him to jump off a high-rise building. <laughs> push-ups? I haven't done push-ups since high school. <laughs> so, as his daughter number one, which just basically means I'm the old one, Dad always encouraged me, as he did all of his children, and he was always positive. And I recently came across a book that's been in my nightstand for probably over 30 years. And just like Dad's nature, he has a sweet little message inside. And it's dated April 1986, and it's called Looking Up for Number One. And on the back it says, Looking Up for Number One tells you how to spend more time on those things that make you happiest and shows how your happiness benefits others. And I thought, that was Dad, for sure. So in closing, I'm so very proud to call Roger Lee Newman my dad. He was a wonderful father and went on to be a wonderful grandpa. Gramps to my Jessica, Cody, and Brayden. And in our final hours with dad as we were saying our goodbyes, Brad and I were with him at one point, just the two of us. And Brad thanked him for being such a great person. And dad put his hand up and put his hand on Brad's chest. 
And then Brad thanked him for being such a wonderful grandpa to our kids. And again, Dad put his hand up. And Brad gave him a high five at that point. It was a moment I will never forget. But that was my dad. He was great to all. I will miss you terribly, Dad. Every time I was with you, I would feel leave me leave feeling happy and a bit better than when I arrived. You made me laugh, you made me happy, you made me proud. So I thank you for being the most amazing dad, the most amazing grandpa. And during this painful time, I'm just envisioning and listening to him say, Shelly, it's okay. It's going to be okay. When we lost grandpa, he, my dad was the one comforting me, and it was his dad. When it came time close to losing my mom, again, my dad was comforting me. So now at this point, I just listen to him saying, it will be okay, Shelly, and I know it will be in time, and I don't know how much time, but someday it will be, it will be okay. I love you, Dad, with all my heart. I don't miss you so, so terribly, but I promise to always love and appreciate music. I will experience the joyful moments, the sad moments. I will experience laughter. And I will strive to be kind and loving to everyone I meet because that is what you would have continued to do and that is what you would have wanted. I love you, Dad, and I'll miss you forever and ever.
I'm Hal Espinosa. <clears throat> I'm glad everybody uh, has come up here reading from their notes because I too have been doing the same thing. <laughs> uh, as, like Rick says, I um, he speaks on the top of the head, and I do the same thing. But the last time I, the last couple of times I've done that, I sit down after I speak, and then. Realize the main thing I want to say, I forgot. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to read it. Roger and I became friends in the early 70s while we were playing on different bands in Los Angeles. I think Roger got here in 69, I got here in 69 also. Maybe Roger got here in 67, 68. But then in 1978, we were both hired to go to Japan with the Billy Bond Band. A band that carried three singers, and as you heard, one of the singers was Mad. Well, it didn't take long for Roger to know he was going to try to hang with them. <laughs> <laughs> After every concert, a few of us, including Mammon, would go out for a late dinner. They'd go back to the room and have a few drinks and just talk about everything and anything. As we neared the end of the tour, and around three weeks into it, and after a late night sofa stop, we ended up in the hallway of our hotel, drinking from a magnum, well, drinking a magnum of sake, really, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> there were a few more people than usual, so it got a little loud. After a short time partying, we were asked to leave. <laughs> Somehow the Magnum ended up in either Roger or Maddie's room, where a few of us continued to party. Uh, some of us seasoned, well, older musicians don't have a clear recollection. But I do remember someone spilling sake on one of the two beds in the room. <laughs> After that night, something was different. <laughs> I don't mean to hint, but uh, after that night, something, <laughs> something really was different. And I'm sure that's when Roger fell in love with humanity. I could see it in his smile and in his eyes. That's, uh, that's when I knew he was you know, really in love. I've got to also say that after that time, on the bus rides, the train rides, the plane rides, you two became an item. So that 
was fun to be there when you guys met them. After returning from Japan, Jeannie and I would entertain with them regularly. Roger was sometimes found hanging out in the sandbox with the girls. Years later, our girls would babysit Rico and Gina. And Roger and Maddie became part of the Espinosa family, not just for the kids then, but for us too. After our move to Santa Clarita, we helped talk, uh, talk them into moving out there with us. And what settled, they started outdoor, out, out doing us on, on parties, because Jeannie and I used to throw a lot of parties. We had a lot of fun, had a lot of friends over. But when you guys bought your house, you guys have gifts. Uh, Roger, one of his big loves was barbecue. So, but one of the main, many backyard events at your home was your wedding. I was Roger's best man, Jeannie was a bridesmaid, and the girls were flower girls. Everyone who knows Roger knows he never got over the side. He was laid back and relaxed, but on this day, you could see, you, you could see it on his face. I mean, he was excited and happy. I haven't seen him like that before. When Maddie Cole was telling us about Roger's prognosis, we were stunned. We hoped and prayed that Roger would get through this. It's still hard to believe that you won't see him again. Roger was larger than life. He filled the room. Look at this. Look around. He filled this room. He was a teacher and mentor to so many of us. He was positive. He always encouraged. His sense of humor, his passion for music, his love of life, the beautiful music he loved, and it will all live forever. He was lucky. You know, he loved a legacy. Roger Newman's rather large band was a training ground for so many remarkable musicians, and we all became better for having played on it. We were all better for knowing it. There are no words to express the emptiness and sorrow we have from his passing. The loss is significant. However, he has left us all with so many wonderful stories and memories that hopefully one day they will help fill the void. The Numans have always been family to us and will always be family. We love you guys. Rest in peace, Roger. Before, before I bring up uh, one senior slide for the closing prayer, I want to relate, and then after that, the band will play, you have to sit around for that, it's going to be amazing. Uh, but I have my favorite story about Roger. Um, uh, I, I know in the house today I saw Mr. the great Pete Chrisley was here. Pete, Pete used to always say how much he hated playing clarinet. And on a session, he'd walk in and take the clarinet out of the case and a gigantic squeak, the first note he'd play, and he'd say, that damn dog? He says, I bury this thing, and he digs it up every time. Well, the thing that Roger actually, I think, did better than that, he, what he did was, he was on his way to a gig, he had the clarinet, uh, putting the horns, for some reason, he put the clarinet in its case on top of his car. <laughs> started to drive to work. And he said it was it was uh, daylight, he's on Volcano Canyon Road, five lanes of traffic, and he said he hears a thump, and in his rearview mirror, he sees his clarinet fall onto the street, and then to probably be driven over by trucks, cars, motorcycles, and he said all, all, he, all he saw was just things flying in the air, keys and pieces of wood. And he, he said all I could do was laugh. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's better than what he did. It's not an idea, he just, you know. Anyway, um, Adam, Adam relates to me a very, a very beautiful story about uh, Monsignor Mike Slattery. During one of Roger's stays at the hospital, uh, Monsignor Slattery came to visit him, and he anointed him with healing oils and prayers. 
Roger later told the family that this was one of the best experiences he ever had. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite Monsignor Slattery up. After that, invite our musicians to come up and play. And uh, Monsignor Slattery. privilege of giving Roger the sacrament of the last appointing. And now, now I pray for his soul. Out of the depths I cry unto you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my voice and supplication. If you, O Lord, knock at it, please, O Lord, who can stand, but with you is forgiveness. I trust in the Lord, my soul trusts in his words. My soul awaits the Lord, more than sentiments await the dawn. But with the Lord is kindness, and with him is precious redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all of their iniquities. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice in supplication, because he has inclined his ears to me the day I called. The cords of death encompassed me, and the snares of the nether world fell upon me. I fell into distress and sorrow, and I called upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, save my life. Yes, gracious is the Lord and just. Our God is merciful. Return, O my soul, to your tranquility. For the Lord has been good to you. For he has freed my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, and my hands from trembling. And I shall walk before the Lord in the lands of the living. And I'd ask you to join with me in singing the Salve Regina, our lady will encompass him under her mantle. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulce Do, Et Spes Nostra Salve. A Te Clamamus, Exules Filii, Ate suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in hoc lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, illos tuos, misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, O pie, O Domini, it looks perpetual as it is, but yes, can't in pace. Amen. Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, members of the band to start coming up and uh, uh, get ready to play. The, uh, the family, the family would like you to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for the celebration of Roger's life. We couldn't think of a better way to honor him except to reunite the rather large band under the direction of his very dear friend, Mr. Brad Dick.
I wanted to talk today, and I said, I'm not sure I can do both. Um, but I have a couple little things I thought I would do. And first of all, I wanted to tell you all, Tom, when asked to do this, was, as I understand, speechless. But we knew he was the right guy to do this because he's been on the band since almost the very beginning as the piano player. And this is the rather large band, which is rather smaller today. And it's taken two of us to try to fill those shoes of a few arms here and a couple of words here and a saxophone here. Um, but Tom took this to heart and he actually played Roger's exact solos from the album and the pieces. Story. And I don't. 
So I thought of two or three little things that I think nobody else knows about Roger, but me and maybe a couple other people in the room. And I'm actually, in hearing some of these other stories, um, Roger was one of these people to me who was like a brother. And I basically believed almost everything he said. And if he said, let's go do this, I would do it. Like going to Tommy Burgers at <laughs> one or two in the morning. <laughs> having all of the chili and extra and onions and all, and then I talked to him the next day, how are you doing? I'm fine, how are you? <laughs> we actually went out with, my son had a bunch of musical friends and he came over for a jam session and about eight of us went to Tommy's and they slept over at our house. They were all groaning and Roger was, what's wrong with these guys? And, but Rico, something you don't know. So that night that your dad came and stayed, all night for that thing. He called me up and he said, hey, Rico's playing, you wanna come here? I'm not sure it's your music, but I would love you to come. And I did, and I'm sorry to say I did not stay for the whole thing. <laughs> I had a date at Tommy Burger with my wife. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, it was wonderful to be in your dad's presence with music I had no connection to. <laughs> but I have to say I got a connection because your dad's love of everything. In fact, I want to say you talked about him being, he's a teacher, but I think the reason Ro Roger was a great teacher because he was always a great and even a better student. He walked into the room sort of like this and smiled and what's in here for me today that's gonna make me happy or teach me something? taught me something every time. Okay, two more quick little things. So, the affair, the love, romance, and all that. So, I met, I, I had heard of Roger's name years before, but I got a call from Ray Anthony one day to play with the band, and you were one of the bookends. Roger, the, sing the two singers, Roger was one of the saxophone players. You both embraced me greatly, but then there was this other woman named Maureen Smith, who was the other bookend. She's here right now, <laughs> 37 years later, but I have to say we had our first date on August 29th, 1981. On September 22nd, we got engaged. <laughs> Roger was the first person I told about it. We had, I'd gone to Carmelo's to hear Rob O'Connell and the Boss Brass, and I said, guess what, Roger? And we'd already become fast friends, and that's how Roger was. I said, Maureen and I are engaged, and this is a, an old, trite sort of thing, but he literally fell off the bar stool. <laughs> what? How long have you guys known each other? And I felt bad. I said, about a month? He says, Madeline and I have been dating for three years. We're not even talking about living together yet. And you know what? Within two months, you were living together. So, <laughs> so here's, here, here's the last one. So, Rick, your story about Murray, the clarinet and the pieces of wood flying. And so Roger had a problem with this because he also had left his saxophone case unzipped once and it fell down and boom, and he had to take it to the repairman. And then the clarinet happened, I'm not sure which order, but he forgot to unzip one more time, or to zip up one more time. I'm talking about the saxophone case. <laughs> He calls me and he says, Brad, you're not gonna believe it. I did it again. I said, I have a gig tomorrow and I don't think you're working much with your tenor right now. Can I borrow your tenor? <laughs> I said, sure. So he drove over sort of close to me and I gave him a location. It was a 7-Eleven. I thought we could meet and just save him a little time and I always like going out for Tommy Burgers, <laughs> which was nearby. Anyway, <laughs> we met at the 7-Eleven parking lot and I pulled out my sax and he said, thank you. And then the last thing he said, you know, we could get arrested for trading sax in a public park. <laughs> <laughs> Little known fact. I could go on, but I think it's time for a lovely tune to celebrate that called Emily. This will feature Tom Renair once again.
have a really special treat. Roger worked for many years, as you know, as a, a mentor and a teacher, and he has some fantastic friends he's worked with from the Midwest, where he's from, and there's a gentleman named Tony Galizia who has known Roger for 35 years plus, and he flew in special today because he said he, there's no way he would not be here, and we're very lucky to have Tony. Come on up, Tony. So, a little earlier, Madeline said something about a beautiful friendship, and this is where you're going to get the payoff. This is a great tune called A Beautiful Friendship, featuring Tony and Tom Peterson to start us off, and I'm getting out of the way. Thank you so much, Madeline, for you, my adopted uh, niece and nephew, Rico, <laughs> Gina, and uh, my best friend and brother, Roger Tom Peterson, Eric Marienthal, Sal Lozano, Brian Scanlon, Lee Callett. From the low end, Julianne Legral on the bass trombone, Ira Napus, Andy Martin, and Paul Young. From the far end again, Dave Richards, Jack Cohen, Wayne Bergeron, Barbara LaRonca, and Bob Summers. <laughs> On the drums, Matt Wittig. Yeah. 
A little later, you're going to hear Jimmy Ford on the drums, both, both stalwarts of the band. On the piano, Jeff Stradling. And this most special man to Roger Newman, Kirk Smith. On the bass. We're now going to play a very popular tune from a very popular cartoon. I think you'll all know it.